who are anointed, it means they're chosen by God for a purpose. It can signify an ordination of some type to some type of service, but it can also signify blessing that God has chosen to bless that individual in a special way. And of course, we today, all of us are the chosen of God. All of us are ordained for God's service. All of us are, are, but God has planned for us to receive a blessing. So we today are the anointed. But to go back to the Old Testament context, he says, don't touch my anointed. Don't harm my prophets. What he was saying, I have a chosen people. And if you'll notice in this text, anointed is not singular, but it's a plural. If you look at various translations, you see the anointed ones. And if you go back to the text, if you read the, the entire psalm, it's rehearsing the nation of Israel and how God has led them. And it seems at this particular point in their history, it's talking about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when, when Israel was a chosen nation but very small, and they were wandering in the land of Canaan that God had promised them, but they were living in tents. And more particularly, Abraham was traveling from here to there and when there was a, a drought or a famine, he would move into a better location. And there are several times you see a variation of the story uh, that I'm about to tell you. But particularly, it seems that you can see this story in Genesis chapter 20. Abraham had gone into the south of Canaan to the area of the Philistines. And he was a little nervous because his wife Sarah was very beautiful. And he knew that when he came to this land of foreigners... She would be so attractive that uh, these pagan people might be tempted that they would want her. And so he was afraid they were going to kill him as a husband and take her. So he said, when we get into this land, don't tell them I'm your husband. Tell them I'm your brother. Well, it was half true because they were half brother and half sister. But obviously it was disguising the most important fact about their relationship. And so he said, in order to protect me, don't tell anybody I'm your, I'm your husband. So sure enough, they go into this land, and the king, Abimelech, sure enough, he sees Sarah as this beautiful foreigner, and he says, uh, take her to my house. And so his servants take her to his house, and uh, he wants to make her his wife. But God begins to deal with him, and God begins to send a curse upon them, sickness and plague. And so Abimelech... We don't know exactly what kind of relationship he had with God, but he became concerned. He, he felt like God was cursing him for some reason. So he sought God, what's going on? And God said, well, she is married to my prophet, and don't touch her 
and don't touch my prophet. And so Abimelech calls Abraham and says, what's going on? And Abraham says, well, that's my wife. He said, why didn't you tell me that? Because I was going to marry her and I, I would have committed sin. And you would have just stood by idly. And I would have sinned against God. But it's interesting, Abraham doesn't come off as a very uh, likable figure in this. First of all, he wasn't honest. And second of all, we don't know how the story would have played out. But it looks like he was trying to save his skin and he was just going to sacrifice his wife's integrity in order to make sure he was okay. But fortunately, God had a higher purpose. And God was looking after his chosen people even when they weren't really cooperating with God as they should. In other words, Abraham, instead of trusting God, was trying to create his own scheme to protect himself, which would have led to disastrous consequences. But God was looking out for Abraham, even when Abraham wasn't looking out for himself in the right way. And God said, that's one of my prophets. Leave him alone. Don't touch him. And so when you read this story in Psalms, or read this comment in Psalms, it seems to fit in that time period. The same thing happened again, happened twice with Abraham and then once with his son Isaac. And so it seems what God was saying here in Psalms, even when my people were just a handful, just a small group, just an extended family, and they were wandering around, and they went into Egypt with Pharaoh, they went into the land of Philistia with Abimelech, I protected them. I told the kings around them, don't bother them. Don't attack them. Those are my anointed. Those are my chosen people. Those are my prophets. They're the ones that hear from God and speak the word of God. Leave them alone. And so even in the Old Testament we find, God says, protect those who are anointed. What I have anointed, you protect. What I have blessed, you protect. Don't harm the anointed ones. And I see this as a principle throughout Scripture. It, it applies, and perhaps you've heard this verse being used for God's chosen leader. And I think there is an application, but that's not the only or maybe even the primary application. But nevertheless, I'll just share a few stories in passing. You read the story of Saul and David. Saul was the king of Israel. But he began to disobey God. And God told Samuel the prophet, Saul is not going to make it. He's not obeying me. I want you to find someone else. And I will anoint them to take over after David, uh, after Saul. And that was, of course, David. Well, Saul began to realize that God was promoting David. He didn't know that Samuel had actually anointed him to be the, the next king. But Saul had enough discernment to know all the people were following after David, and God's blessing was on David. God's blessing was departing from Saul. So he became very jealous of David, even sought to kill him. David had to flee for his life and go out into the wilderness. And you find two occasions in 1 Samuel 24 and also in 1 Samuel 26 that Saul and his army is chasing David and his small band of followers, and David is fleeing into the Judean wilderness, and he's hiding in caves and hiding in the mountains, and Saul is chasing him. And one night, Saul and his army sleeping, and doesn't, they don't realize that David is nearby. And uh, then another time, Saul is in a cave and doesn't realize that actually David and his men are hiding in the back of the cave. In both cases, David had an opportunity to kill Saul. And David's men said, uh, God has placed him in your hands. He's asleep. It, nobody's watching. They don't even know we're here. Why don't you creep into the camp, cut his head off, or we'll do it for you. And in both times, David said, no. Don't touch God's anointed. He's God's chosen king. He's the leader. Even though he's in the wrong, and even though one day God is going to put me in that place, I should not take matters in my own hands and attack God's anointed. I must wait for God's time. So he says, don't touch God's anointed one. And that's a powerful lesson of how we should respect spiritual leadership in our lives. And even if spiritual leadership is not always correct, still the principle is, that's God's man. That's God's leader. You keep your hands off. Let God deal with that person. Because God may be talking to that person. And, and God may, if, if he makes a mistake, God can show him what to do about that mistake. It's not our job to attack. 
And you know, in our day, there's not much respect for authority, whether it be government officials or education system. And I guess in many ways, there's a good reason why there's not much respect, because some people in leadership haven't acted in a way to deserve much respect. But still, there's a principle that we should respect godly leadership. And even if the person is not a Christian, God has placed order in society, order in government. We need to respect authority. And so, in our day, there's, there's a, a lessened respect, and that's even affected the church. I remember when I was a pastor, and it would shock me when this would happen, because most of the time, people would respect pastoral authority. And if someone was doing wrong and I had to talk to them, they were apologetic or repentant, or even if they weren't ready to change their ways, at least they were respectful. But every once in a while, I would find somebody that I would say, listen, I need to talk to you about thus and so, and here's what you've done, and I want to help you. And, and they would just completely deny it. No, I never did that. Oh, that's a false accusation. And sometimes I knew good and well. I had the evidence. Or I had enough discernment. And I would say, wait a minute. I'm your pastor. I'm sitting here trying to help you. It's got to start with you telling the truth. Oh, no, I didn't do that. That's false. That's a lie. And I don't know why people would tell you that and so on and so forth. Well, you can't really help someone like that. And then in some cases, I, I remember I'd go come say, okay. And I'd come back a, le- a week later and have written proof laying out. And the, the person would say, oh, yeah, I did that. And I was thinking, I'm surprised God doesn't strike you with a bolt of lightning right now. It's one thing to commit sin and be repentant, or even if you're not repentant, admit what you did. It's another thing just to bawly lie and have no sense of remorse. That's a dangerous place to be. Now, I don't think we as pastors should be authoritarian or dictatorial. But I look at it like a doctor. It'd be what I just shared with you would be kind of like going to the doctor. And uh, you've got a serious problem. And so you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, Well, okay, I'm looking at several different things. It could be this, could be that. So tell me, do you have a pain here? Oh, no, I don't have a pain there. Uh, did you have such and such a symptom last week? Oh, no, not such a symptom. Well, okay, well, I guess we'll, you, you're good. We'll go. And if you're lying to the doctor, what happens? Does it hurt the doctor? No. You're the one that suffers. So if you have cancer and yet you keep lying about the symptoms, you end up dying of cancer. It doesn't really cause the doctor a problem. You're the one that pays the consequences of lying. So I kind of look at that as what it means to obey spiritual authority. It's not for the benefit of the spiritual authority. It's not to make them feel great. It's not so they can be a a lord or a dictator over God's people. It's so that they can fulfill their job, which is to help us. And so we need to heed that. Don't touch God's anointed leader. Because God's anointed leader is trying to help you. And even if that leader is not fully accomplishing the purpose, God has ways If we will pray and if we will be faithful and if we will be submissive, God has a way of working it all out. But it's not our job to take matters in our own hands and touch God's anointed. It's our job to submit to the will of God. And He will work in all of our lives. And so we should respect God's chosen leader. Don't touch God's anointed. But the anointing is not just with the leader The anointing speaks more generally of the presence of God. And I'm thinking of the story in 2 Samuel chapter 6. The the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence in the midst of His people. And finally, Israel won a great victory under now King David. And they captured, recaptured the Ark. And they were going to bring it back to Jerusalem. It was a time of great victory, a great celebration. And as they carried the ark, they made the mistake. God was very specific in describing how the ark was to be handled. It was supposed to be carried on on, um, sticks, or, or, or you might say it was supposed to be carried on the backs of the priests through poles. But instead, 
they, see, they had seen what the, the, the Philistines had done. They put it on a cart. And so they are already not following God's plan. And so as the ox cart was going down the road, it was bumpy. The ark started jumping around, and one of the priests saw. It looked like to him, as the ark, as, as, as the cart jolted, it looked like the ark might fall out, which would be terrible. So he reached out, and he steadied it. It seemed like a good thing to do, but God had been very specific. Don't touch the ark. That's sacred. That's holy. That represents my presence. You carry it on poles where the, the poles will be on the shoulders, but you don't carry the ark in your hands. You don't take the sacred things of God and grasp them in your own hands as if you are in control, as if you decide what to do with God's presence or God's anointing. And so when Uzzah violated the command of God, even though he had a good intention, it was a clear violation of God's command, and he died instantly. Don't touch the anointing. Protect the anointing. It's the presence of God in the midst of his people. Well, then later, as they continued to bring the ark, this time on the poles, on the shoulders of the priest, as the ark came toward Jerusalem, it was such a great time of celebration and restoration. The King David said, you, you go a few paces, stop, and offer a sacrifice. You go a few more paces, you stop, you offer a sacrifice. And he got so excited, he took off his kingly robe, and he was just dressed in his common linen garment, and he began dancing and praising God and worshiping God. I, I believe he felt the presence of God much as we do today. He was overjoyed. He was excited. All of Israel was, was, was worshiping. The horns were blowing. The people were cheering. The king was dancing. And his wife, Michael, King Saul's daughter, looked out the window and she thought, he's just acting like a commoner. He should be acting like a king. He should be dressed in his royal robe. This should be an impressive ceremony. We should go through a strict liturgy. Instead, he's down in the street dancing with all the commoners. He's taking away side his kingly robe and all, all the servants can just look at him as an ordinary common person. And so she rebuked him. And David said, you know what? I'm going to dance even more. When it comes to celebrating God's presence, no matter what you criticize, I'm going to worship God all the more. And the Bible says that Michael had no children. She, she was barren to the day of her death because she did not respect the anointing. So here you see the anointing goes beyond the box. And it starts talking about the worship, entertaining the presence of God, respecting the anointing of, of God, respecting what God has chosen. Don't touch the anointed. Respect the people of God. Respect the leaders of God. Respect the presence of God. Respect the worship of God. It's a teaching of respect. And then finally, if you'll notice my text, as I said, it's plural, the anointed ones, not just the leaders, but actually it's God's people, the collective people that God has chosen. Don't touch the anointed ones. Don't touch my prophets. And really in the New Testament, we see this come to pass in the church because really all of God's people are the chosen ones. Now it's not just the nation of Israel, but people of every Nationality can enter into God's presence. He, 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 people of every background, every walk of life, every race, every color, every language can become part of God's people. Not by being born the first time physically, but by being born again spiritually. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, you all take on the same family name, the name of Jesus. You're all washed by the same blood, the blood of Jesus. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you all receive the one Spirit of God. When you speak in tongues, that's given you all a common language where although languages have divided the human race since the Tower of Babel, now through speaking in tongues, the all nations are united into 
one church, to one family of God. So now we are the anointed ones. The New Testament says we're all kings and priests to God. No longer. All of us may prophesy. I'm not saying all of us are preachers, but every one of us can have a testimony. Every one of us can have an anointed prayer. Your prayer can change a person's life. You can intercede for someone. And you may not be a preacher. You may not be a pastor. But your prayers can change the destiny of a lost person. Your prayers can become prophetic. Your testimony can become prophetic because you are the chosen of God. And so now we step into that promise. And the Bible says, don't touch God's anointed. Respect the people of God in whom is the Spirit of God who are speaking the Word of God. And that's why you have a passage such as 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. It says, don't you know you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. And then it goes on to say that if you defile the temple of God, God will destroy you because the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, the, the King James says ye because it's plural. Now, there are passages like 1 Corinthians 6, which says singular, your body is the temple of God's Spirit. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit dwells in you, and your body is His temple. But 1 Corinthians 3 is using a plural. We are the temple of God collectively. So while it's true that each of us individually is filled with the Spirit, and wherever we go, we take the Spirit of God with us, we are the temple of God wherever we go. But yet it's also true that when we come together, we are the temple of God. You know good and well the church is not the building. The church is the people. So when we come together for a prayer meeting, it might be just house-to-house prayer. But Jesus said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Or when we come together on a Sunday night service and we all worship, then we become the temple of God, all of us. And the Spirit of God works in our midst. Now, God will work in private prayer in your home. But there are also things that God does in the corporate assembly. That's why it's so important when we pray together, when we worship. There should be no ordinary or average service. And sometimes on holiday weekends like this, we understand that people are gone and all of that. But no matter how small the crowd or no matter how simple the service, we should respect the fact that when God's people are gathered, that's the church, that's the anointed ones, that's the chosen ones, and God's anointed is in our midst. God's presence is in our midst. God's Spirit is in our midst. There's the opportunity for a miracle. So we should respect the anointing. And so if we if we attack not only the physical body, but if we attack the spiritual body, then we're in trouble. Don't defile the body. Not just talking about the physical body, but the body of Christ, the spiritual body, the gathering of the people. And so this applies to everyone, whether it be a leader who, who is abusive or whether it be someone in the church who decides for themselves what they're going to do. And what they do starts hurting other people. This is where the warning comes into play. Don't touch my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. It's not only talking about the leader, it's on every member of the church. Be careful what you do because what you do affects the rest of the body. You know, we Americans, we think so individualistically, well, I'll just do what I want to do. And if I want to do it, then that's okay. But wait a minute. Now you're a child of God. Now you're a member of a family. Now you're a member of the body of Christ. What you do will have an impact on everyone around you. So it's not just about you. It's also about your fellow believers. In other words, there should be a holy respect for the people of God, for the house of God, for the church of God, for the corporate worship and prayer. There should be a sense of sacredness every time we come to worship, every time we come to a prayer meeting. Every time we come to a home Bible study, every time we come in here to the sanctuary, there should be a sense of awe. There should be a sense of the holy presence of God. There should be a sense, I don't want to do anything to hurt 
I want to contribute and I want to help. So whether it be gossip or whether it be just a bad spirit or a bad attitude or whether it be just a, an uncooperative spirit, we've got to be really careful because we are part of the anointed. We are part of the chosen ones. We are part of what God is doing in these last days. Think about Austin, Texas. How many truly spirit-filled bodies of believers are there in this city? We've got to do our part. If we, if we harm the body, what's going to happen to Austin, Texas? What's going to happen to hundreds of thousands of people that their spiritual destinies are depending upon us? So we have to look beyond ourselves. And of course, we come to church to be blessed. And we come to church for our family to be blessed. And that's good. That's fine. We have programs that are designed to help us and to help our children and our grandchildren. That's all great. But we should look beyond what's in it for me. When we give to missions, we're not thinking about what's in it for me. Even when we give our tithes, while we know that supports the pastor and the ministry of the church, the main reason for giving that is not what I can get out of it. And likewise, when we come to church, yes, we want to be blessed. And sometimes we're exhausted and we need refreshing. Sometimes we're sick and we need healing. Sometimes we need a miracle. And so certainly we come to church to receive. But it should not be only to receive. We also come to give. We come to support. We come to strengthen the body because we have respect for the anointed ones, the chosen ones, the holy ones. It's not just about us. Our city is depending on us. And so I'm thankful to be part of New Life Church. I was just looking, Brother Shaw. You know, we started a number of daughter works and preaching points, and I don't know exactly. Some have been started since I was a pastor, and of course some closed, some new are open. But if I'm correct, counting this building, I think there are at least 11 self-governing churches affiliated with United Pentecostal Church International. And 11 church buildings that are owned in several cases already paid for, three or four cases already paid for, and at least one more church has bought property to build upon. That's significant and meaningful that we've established outposts across Austin and Central Texas. And, of course, we're not the only ones. We don't claim to be the only ones. But I'm saying we are making a difference. Then I was thinking, out of new life have come Many ministers, some, some came for training. They were already licensed, and, and we put them into work and daughter works and so forth. And others have been licensed since coming here or, or since being saved. I think there's a total of about 60 ministers that have come out of new life, either to receive ministerial credentials or receive an upgrade or become daughter work pastors or assistant pastors or whatever the case may be. About 60 ministers, some of whom are here, have gone out into the harvest. And I was thinking right now, some of you know Kara Inman, one of the converts of our first building. She, she came on the dedication of our first building and that weekend received the Holy Ghost. She's now an associate missions in New Zealand and previously she served in Jordan. That's an extension of this church. I'm thinking of, of Brother Steve Hamilton. He was our outreach director, but he and his wife went to Albuquerque, New Mexico and started a church. And I could just go down the list or just up the road in Georgetown, Brother Hustledge. We sent him to take a little church. In fact, the pastor, when he was retiring, specifically asked, can you find a pastor to send there? And the Hustledges were already planning to go back to Alaska, but God just stopped them in their tracks. And they didn't know what was going on. They came to me as pastor and said, we made all of our plans to go. We announced everybody to go. We raised money to go, but God has told us we can't go. They'd sold their house and everything. And they were renting in Georgetown. And about a month after that conversation, this opportunity came open. I said, you know what? Why don't you go preach? And sure enough, when they came, the pastor said, oh, these are our next pastors. Brother Hustage hadn't even told his wife or his kids. And he said, wait a minute. I, I, I'm just coming to preach for you. But it was the will of God. So what I'm saying is this church has reached out into those daughter works. But, but not only the daughter works. We've reached out in Georgetown, and Georgetown started a church in Gerald. Now I hear they're starting in Liberty Hill. So we've got from our efforts, it's not just limited to the next step, but 
Now it's expanded even further. And, and we've sent people literally around the world and to other states. So what I'm saying, God has got a lot going on. And if we just become selfish and say, what's in it for me? And I don't like what's happening or I want this or I want more. If we're not careful, we could hurt what God is trying to do. But if we will continue in prayer, if we will be full of the Holy Ghost, then there's no telling what God can do through us through our church, through our prayers, through our ministry. You don't have to be a preacher to have a ministry. But as you support the kingdom of God, as you support the local church, as you bring souls who are one to the Lord, as you help disciple, each one of us has a place. Some of us are especially guilty gifted in bringing new people. Some are especially gifted in teaching people. Some excel in taking those who already want to the Lord and making them feel welcome, discipling them, befriending them, encouraging them. Some are especially gifted in being like a mentor, a mother or a father or an elder brother or sister to people in church. Some are especially able to give. Some are especially able in intercessory prayer. And of course all of us should be involved in all these things. But God has different people in the church that have different roles. But as we all work together, amazing things happen. But if we just focus on our little area and don't respect what others are doing, then we could hurt the big picture. And so as I was praying for this, and actually I got this message probably a couple years ago, but never felt the time to speak of it. But I was thinking, and I was trying to apply it to my own life. God is doing amazing things in our church, in our lives, in each one of you. Many of you, I could tell your testimony of how you came to the Lord or, or how God has, has brought you to this place and you've grown, you've expanded, you, you have an active role, you've done many good things. And if we look around, the church is full of people who have made different kinds of contributions. But the purpose of my message is for us just to step back and say, Okay, what is God doing? I want to be part of what God is doing. I don't want to hinder, but I want to help. I want to add my contribution. Because the Bible says, don't touch God's anointed. What God is doing, don't hinder it, but help it. So whether it be the pastor or the assistant pastor or the youth pastor or some leader, obviously, we want to support them and respect them and not hinder them or hurt them. But it doesn't just, it doesn't just extend to that. That's, that's not all of it. But when the presence of God moves in a service, it's like the Ark of the Covenant being brought in the building. I don't want to just stand on the sidelines. I don't want to be a hindrance to the move of the Spirit. And not only that, I want to encourage the flow of the Spirit. I mean, I just don't want to be a bystander. Everybody else worships, and I'm just carried along in the stream. No, I want to be part of the flow of God. And when it comes to worship, we all have our own personalities, our own styles. Okay, that's fine. But I don't want to be the one that drags down the worship. On the contrary, I want to add something to the worship. I want to get in tune with the Spirit. I want to add my part to it. And when one member of the body is struggling, I don't want to kick them when they're down. I don't want to add gossip to the, to the, you know, whatever situation might be. But not only do I, I don't want to be a harm, I want to be a help. When somebody's lying there, I don't want to kick them, but I don't want to just walk past them either. I want to extend a hand and pull them up. In other words, I'm saying, don't touch God's anointed. Do my prophets no harm. It starts with respecting the people of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the work of God. But it goes on beyond that. We can turn it around to a positive and say, wait just a minute. I don't want to hurt them. I want to help them. I want to be part of them. I want to add to the work of God. I want to be part of the work of God. I want to be part of the anointing. I want to treasure the anointing because it's made all the difference in my life. You and I wouldn't be here if it was just traditional church, would we? Many of us came from traditional church. That's not what saved you. What has made the difference in your life is the anointing. So I want to protect the anointing. I want to protect what God is doing special in our church. I want to protect what God 
God's plan is for our city. I want to be sensitive to the move of God. I don't want to harm it. I don't want to stand in the way. But neither do I just want to stand on the sidelines either. I want to be right in the middle of whatever God is doing. I want to play my part in the work of the kingdom of God. I want to be part of that anointing. I want to be part of the chosen ones, the anointed ones. And so the burden of my heart is tonight, protecting the anointing. What is God trying to do in our lives? What is God trying to do in our church? What is God trying to do in our city? I was pastor here for 18 years. Brother Shaw has been pastor for eight years. I really believe the best is yet to come. I don't believe our best days are in the past. I don't believe our greatest victories in the past. A year ago, we celebrated our 25th anniversary. A beautiful book was published that had all wonderful testimonies. Many of you were in there. But you know what? I don't believe those are the greatest stories. I believe the greatest stories are being written right now and are going to be written. And you are going to be in them. You are going to be writing them. So I'm saying let's protect the anointing. Don't look at it. Well, we've arrived. We'll coast from here on out. We've arrived, so my my part is not needed. No, I think God has a plan for our church. I, ha- I believe God has a plan for Brother and Sister Saul. I believe God has a plan for each one of us. Oh, let's protect the anointing. I, I hope I'm somehow connecting to you right now. Oh, let's protect the anointing. Let's treasure what God is doing. The best is right here. It's in 2018 and until the coming of the Lord. Let's value the anointing. Let's protect the anointing. Let's treasure the anointing. Just as much if the priests were ushering in the Ark of the Covenant, we would stand back in awe, wouldn't we? But much greater than the Ark of the Covenant is here. The presence of Almighty God is extended to each one of us. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God told those ancient kings, That's my chosen family. Don't touch them. Don't hurt them. Protect the anointed. And I think the principle extends today. There are many churches in this city, and and there are a number of churches that are preaching the message of salvation. I'm not taking away from any one of them. But I'm just saying we are here and now. And God is doing a work in our midst. What does God want to do in your life? What does God want to do with your family? What does God want to do with our church? I would like for us to to seek after God right now. Lord, speak to us. Help us not to stand in the way of what you're doing. Help us not to hinder what you're doing. But actually, help us to be in the big middle of what you're doing. Help us to give our part so that what you have chosen is truly successful. This is the kind of service where God speaks to someone and confirms a calling. This is a service where God may answer some questions. And you you may not get all the answers tonight, but you can get an assurance that God is speaking and God is working. As we close our eyes in prayer, I'm not sure exactly what God wants to accomplish. But if there's somebody here tonight, you feel like that God is speaking to you to step up to the next level, to treasure the anointing, to protect the anointing, whether it be a call that God has placed in your life or whether you discern why you're part of this local body. And if you'd like to step forward into that. I want you to come right now. And of course, we always extend it for someone that needs to receive the Holy Ghost. God is calling you to become part of His anointed family. There's room for every one of us. All we need to do is repent of our sins and open our heart to God. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost tonight. And you can be part of the plan that I'm talking about. Is there someone here tonight that you'd like to come and pray? And you'd like to seek after God. Maybe this message is for my benefit tonight because even though I'm the general superintendent, I need to be sensitive to the voice of God. 
I don't need to be a hindrance to what God is doing. I need to promote what God is doing. I don't need to be caught up in a function or a title or a position. I need to protect the anointing. I need to protect the move of God. I need to be part of what God is trying to do in these last days. Hallelujah. Would you come and pray? If the Lord is talking to your heart, why don't you come? Let's seek the Lord. Lord, what can I do? Not to hinder, but to help. What can I do to protect the anointing? To protect the people of God in Austin? To protect the leaders in Austin? To protect the spirit of worship in our assembly? To protect the move of God? What can I do to protect what you're trying to do in these last days at New Life in Austin, Texas? Would you spend a little time in prayer? Who knows what God will do? God will confirm His Word if we all call upon Him. Let's pray together.